Okay, hello. Well, I guess we're going to start. It's 4.20. So, well, first, uh, welcome to, to my talk. Let me see if I can use a different microphone because I don't like to stay here. Hello, hello. It's working. Uh, okay, well, um, yeah, again, well, thank you for uh, coming to my presentation. Uh, as you can see, my name is Gustavo Silva, and well, I am a kernel engineer. Uh, before we start, I would like to, um, I mean, I would like to ask you a couple of questions, just to have an idea of, uh, of the people in the audience. So, how many of you are kernel developers? Some, right? And um, from, from the rest, how many of you as RC, RC programmers? Okay, well, most of you. Okay, great. And, well, how many of you uh, know about the kernel self-protection project or have heard about it? Few? Okay, that's great. Okay, that's great because, well, now we all, you all are going to know about this project. Uh, okay, well, let's start. Uh, yeah, today we are going to be talking about um, some challenges and innovations towards um, special safety in the Linux kernel, in particular when it comes to array bounce checking uh, for certain types of arrays that we are going to see. Uh, my work in the kernel community has always been supported by the Linux Foundation and recently by Alpha Omega. And okay, a couple of words about me. Um, I am a kernel engineer. I've been doing uh, kernel hardening for eight years. I am part of the kernel self-protection project, which is basically the, uh, the, the Linux kernel uh, division of the Google Open Source Security team. However, I don't work, I, I'm not a, a Google employee. And well, this is the agenda for today. We are going to start with some very, uh, very simple and very basic uh, concepts about arrays. And uh, we are going to build on top of that, so we are going to uh, use that as a base for the, for the rest of the presentation. Then we are going to move on to, uh, of course, to the main part of this presentation, which is about um, hardening the Linux kernel, particularly when it comes to main copy, array bounds. And we are going to explore some interesting compiler options and attributes that we have been using to harden the Linux kernel in recent times. And of course, at the end, some conclusions. Okay, well, this is probably the, the, the most simple uh, declaration of an array in the C language. Uh, what's important to know this here is that, well, this array, the size of this array is clearly well-defined uh, at compile time, right, at declaration. Um, something that, um, I mean, one of the weakness, uh, weaknesses of, uh, of the C language, and in particular of uh, arrays, is that it is always up to us as a C programmers, as a developers, to make sure that we are not going to read from uh, or write into uh, beyond the boundaries of, uh, of our arrays. This is fairly simple, but it's going to be important for, for the presentation, so. Okay, a special use case for arrays is when we need to use them in structures, of course. And particularly uh, when we use them at the end of structures and those arrays, we are going to say that those are trailing arrays, right? So again, the size of this trailing array is clearly well-defined at compile time, right? Now, uh, there are some situations in which we need to, uh, we don't know uh, exactly how big our arrays are going to be at build time. So in those situations, we use flexible arrays. So the size of flexible arrays uh, are going to be determined at runtime. So here's an example of a, of a flexible array. And, and of course, well, uh, a structure that contains a flexible array, uh, we are going to say that that's a flexible structure, okay? So we have flexible structure and it's flexible array. Yeah, again, uh, we use a flexible array when uh, the size of this array is going to be determined uh, dynamically. Uh, the, the right term uh, for, the, the right technical term for flexible arrays uh, are flexible array members. 
and they were introduced to the language in C99. Um, they were introduced as a proper way to declare exactly what I just mentioned, uh, to declare a flexible array, those arrays that we don't know how big they are going to be at compile time. And well, before C99 uh, flexible array members, instead of, uh, instead of this, people would use uh, zero length arrays or one element arrays. And well, that was prone to all, some, uh, all sorts of issues, uh, but that's what, what people had at the time, right? That was the, the only way to, to declare these, these types of arrays. Something important to notice here and something that is going to be um, an important part uh, uh, later on in the presentation is that usually when we declare flexible array members, we also include in the same structure a member that is going to be used as the counter. And the counter means that that member is going to, to, to contain, to, to hold the total number of elements our flexible array is going to contain a runtime. Right, so this memory is going to be updated with, uh, with the number of items or elements uh, our array is going, to, is going to have a runtime. Here is an example of how we would allocate a heap space for a flexible structure along with its flexible array member. So this is uh, a, common, a common code construct. Um, we, of course, we get, we calculate the size of the whole structure, and then we calculate the, the size of, uh, of our array and the total number of elements. In the kernel, particularly when it comes to kernel hardening, we don't like this open coded arithmetic because that's usually prone to uh, integer overflows. And that's a bit dangerous, particularly when we use that uh, during memory allocations. So for that, we have a helper. Uh, the stroke size helper is the is, is, is what we use instead of, uh, of doing this open coded uh, arithmetic. Okay, so now one day I was doing some, actually I, I was working on this. I was uh, looking for this open coded arithmetic and was replacing those with, with the stroke size helper, uh, trying to, make it, to mitigate uh, interior overflows during memory allocations. When I run into, into this issue, and well, the problem here is that we have a zero length array uh, just before the last member of a structure. The issue is that that um, a runtime, if we allocate some memory for this, uh, for this array, and we use it as a flexible array member, and we write data into this array, we are going to corrupt RCU head. And well, that's undefined behavior. We're going to run into, into, uh, into undefined behavior, so that's a bug, we need to fix it. And well, the fix was quite simple. We just need to, uh, to move that array to the end of the structure and now transform it into a flexible array member. And with that, well, the, the issue is fixed. Now, uh, this is a simple fix, however, if uh, someone else comes and adds a new member after the flexible array member, now the compiler is going to complain and well, our code is not going to build. So that's one advantage uh, of multiple advantages of a flexible array member over, uh, for instance, a zero length array. So those sorts of issues, at least in the structure, well, they are not going to happen anymore. So, well, uh, actually this was the moment when uh, we, in the kernel self-protection project, we realized the importance of looking for more of these issues across the whole kernel tree, and, uh, but um, most importantly, trying to prevent them, right, uh, from happening in the first place. So at the time, this was a simple fix. This was, we were running to, into this issue, and this was actually crucial for all the work we have been doing over the past five years. And that is going to be uh, the rest of the presentation. We are going to be exploring that work in the rest of the presentation. So it was important to mention this, this issue because this was the, the origin of a lot of things in kernel hardening. And well, at the time, um, I, um, we, we discovered this bug in 2019 and it was an eight-year-old bug. Okay, well, now let's get into, into the, main, the main part of the, of the presentation. 
Um, back in 2020, I don't know how many of you know about these uh, vulnerabilities, the bleeding tooth vulnerabilities. One person, yeah, uh, a couple of people. Okay, well, back in 2020, um, a security researcher at Google found, I think there were three, three in total vulnerabilities that he, he decided to call them the bleeding tooth vulnerabilities. Obviously, because uh, the code was, uh, was Bluetooth code, right? And one of them is this one, the bad vibes. So what is going on here? Uh, what we have here, we have a, an array of a concrete size at compile time in the middle of a structure, right? And on this other side, we have, um, oh, well, that's the rest of the, of the structure. And on this other, on this other side, we have uh, a main copy. So we are writing certain data of certain size into this array of concrete size, right? The problem here was that, uh, well, length, which uh, contains the number of bytes we want to write into, the, into this array, was not uh, being sanity checked before calling main copy. So that's usually not great. And what happens here is that what happened here is that the the security researcher he was speculating about the possibility of overflowing this array and corrupting uh, this next list head pointer. And, and yeah, well, uh, it actually he, he, he did it, right? <laughs> he he speculated about it and he actually did it. He he managed to corrupt. Uh, this this pointer. So that begs the question: What's the problem with functions like main copy? Well, one of the issues is that uh, main copy is a pretty naive API. Similarly to the case of, of arrays in general in the C language, we we need to make sure that we are not reading beyond or or writing beyond the the boundaries of both source and the destination objects if we want to secure the integrity of, uh, of the ADA. So what do you think was the fix at the time for bad vibes? Any guess? Yeah, that was the fix. They just needed to uh, sanity check the number of bytes against the maximum number of bytes this array could contain, right? And well, that was a simple fix. Uh, however, well, we might uh, think more about, uh, well, we, we might start thinking about if we could do something to prevent these sort of vulnerabilities, these sorts of issues. Probably, probably we could modify main copy. We could create our own version of main copy, our own fortified version of main copy. And instead of, uh, of having to sanity check every time we have to call the fun this function, probably include these sort of checks inside the function. Right? That would be great to have, right? Okay, well, we have, or well, at the time when this vulnerability happened, we had a fortified version of main copy. So this is before bad vibes. Let's see, let's see how, how this works. The workhorse of, uh, of a fortified version of main copy at the time was building object size. This is a building compiler function. So what this uh, building function does is basically we pass a pointer and it returns the size of the object this pointer is pointing to, right? That is that, is that simple. So in this case, we, we pass a pointer to both destination and source objects and we expect this building function to return the size of those objects if it can, if it can right? Because probably Probably uh, uh, so sometimes it's, it's not possible. So let's let's see how the rest of the code works. Um, the next part of the fortify uh, main copy, uh, we check if we if that size if that number of bytes we want to write into a destination uh, is a constant at compile time. If that is the case, well, we just check uh, the the sizes that this building function return against the size, the number of bytes we want to write in or read from these objects. And in the case that uh, we don't have enough space, well, we are going to return, we are going to trigger a warning or an error. 
And well, in the case that uh, the size cannot be determined at compile time, well, we check at runtime, right? Okay, if everything, if everything went right, if, uh, if we have enough space in our objects, well, uh, we execute uh, main copy, right? Okay, now let's see more in depth how building object size works. Okay, for the purpose of the kernel, uh, we are going to focus on two different modes in which we can use this building compiler function. Uh, there are actually four in total, but for the kernel, uh, they are relevant, these two. Okay, here we have an example. We have a structure with some, uh, some fields, some members. And let's see how mode zero and mode one works. Well, first, mode zero, when we pass a pointer uh, to this building uh, function, and we use it in mode zero, in mode zero it is going to return the size from the beginning of the object to the outer structure. And in mode one, it's going to return the actual size of the object. So let's take a look. In this case, we pass a pointer to count, and in mode zero, it returns the total size of the structure. So that's an important difference. If we use this, uh, this function in mode one, it returns the actual size of the, of the object. In the case of an array, again, it's going to return the number of bytes from the beginning of the array to the end of the structure, which is uh, 12 bytes. In, in mode one, it returns the number of bytes of that array, the, the, the size of the object, right? In the case of a flexible array, well, at the time, uh, and, uh, and, and up, and up, to, uh, up to, to today, <laughs> this building function cannot determine the size of a flexible array member. So in this case, it returns, I don't know. Minus one means here that I don't know, in both, in both modes, right? Okay. So now let's see how uh, this 45 version of main copy behaves with bad vibes. As we have seen, uh, in, in main copy, we use building object size in mode zero. So what happens is that if we pass a pointer to this array of a fixed size, it's going to return the size from the beginning of the array up to the end of the outer structure, not even discovery state. It's going to return the end to, to the end of HCI depth. And, and, that, and that's an issue because even when, when uh, the security researcher didn't enable uh, the 45 version of main copy and test its code against it, well, mm, that version of main copy really couldn't do anything about it, right? It was going to be, the code was going to be exploited anyways. So we started to ask ourselves like, uh, okay, what can we do about this issue? What, uh, is, if, if there is something we could do? Well, the solution is simple, right? We replace, instead of using building object size in mode zero, uh, we, we use building object size in mode one, and with that we secure that in, in this same scenario, instead of returning the size from the beginning of the array to the end of the outer structure, now it's going to return the actual size of the array, right? So this vulnerability uh, with this change, this vulnerability, this, this type of vulnerabilities are prevented. So life is beautiful, right? <laughs> okay, but what about intentional cross-member overflows? Uh, in the kernel and in any C code base, we are going to have the case where we are going to have any number of members in any structure, and we want to write or read across multiple members, right? So, and that's totally fine. So this is an example, right? In this case, we are using main copy to write data across th three adjacent arrays, right? And, and that's correct. However, if we want to use building object size in mode one, we are going to get a lot of false positives in the kernel, right? Because a lot of code that writes across multiple members in the same structure is, is correct, right? They are doing exactly what, what they should do. Okay, so what can we do about this issue? And again, well, uh, we, we run into, into this problem, of course, and we, and we saw a lot of false positives. So one solution, one possible solution is to enclose those members in a substructure. 
Um, the issue with that is that if we do that, now we have to, if we want to access those members, we first need to go through the, through the name, through this new identifier, right? And for a lot of people, that's called code charm, right? They are not willing to do that. They are like, well, I, I don't want to do that, simply. Okay, so in this scenario, uh, for that, we created uh, the Stroke Group Helper. With the Stroke Group Helper, we can enclose any number of members that we want to, uh, to write across. And we also have an identifier for those members. However, when we, when we use this, uh, this, is the, this helper and we want to access each one of the members within the group, we don't necessarily have to, have to use this new identifier. We can, the magic of through group is that we can access each member directly. So these are two valid different ways in which we can access these objects. Now, let's see what's the magic behind through group. Well, it was created by um, Case Cook and, and, and Kate Packard. Case Cook, if you don't know, is the, is the leader of, of the project. And well, this is the magic uh, of through group. Uh, we have a union, and within the union, we have a couple of structures. One of them is an anonymous structure. And this is actually the structure that is going to allow us uh, uh, to, to access each member directly, right? And we have a name structure, and both, of, both structures are, are going to share the same memory layout, right? And with, the, with this name structure, now we can, we, we gain bounce checking uh, for, for the whole group of members. So yeah, it is very versatile. So this actually was the solution for the multiple number of false positives we, we, we had when we started to use building object size in mode one in, in, in main copy. So this was the solution. Yeah, with through group, we avoid all those false positives and well, we gain bounce checking on those groups of objects. And yeah, that was great. Okay, so now, again, life is beautiful, right? Well, let's take another look at how building object size works with flexible arrays. Again, if we use uh, either uh, building object size in mode zero or in mode one, we are going to get the same result uh, for the case of flexible array members, right? The, this building function simply, it doesn't know how big this array is. So let's see how main, main copy behaves when we want to write uh, data uh, into a flexible array member. So here at the top, we have a flexible structure, we have our flexible array, and we are writing something into, into this array, right? Okay, so again, building object size uh, is going to return minus one. Uh, size t is subtype on signed integers, so destination size is going to turn into a really big number. Now, why? Well, first, why, why building object size returns minus one for for the flexible array? Well, a flexible array member is an object of incomplete type, and let's remember that part of the type of an object is its size, right? So, a declaration it lacks a size, so that's the logic behind um, building object size returning. I don't know. Okay, when that happens, uh, destination size is going to turn into a really big number, and this condition is always going to be false. So the code, um, well, bounce checking is not possible in this case, of course, and the code is going to fall through all the way down to the execution of main copy, right? That's it. So this is expected behavior, because we, at this point, we cannot do anything about it. We cannot sanity check a flexible array member because we, the compilers we don't have the infrastructure to help us, right? However, when we were playing with flexible array members, uh, this 45 version main copy, and in general with trailing arrays, we noticed something quite disturbing. And it's the problem that building object size was returning, I don't know, for any trailing array. So it doesn't matter if it, were, if it was a, a flexible array member. Uh, do you remember our, our, our structure, our first example? Okay, here clearly at compile time, at build time, the compiler has everything it needs to determine the size of this array. 
However, it was saying that I don't know. So that was that was interesting to uh, uh, try to figure out. So yeah, under this scenario, main copy, the 45 version of main copy that we had at the time, was not able to sanity check not only flexible array members but any trailing array of any size. So that was a big issue because that means that uh, I mean. If, if there were, uh, if, if there was a flexible a trailing array of a concrete size at build time that was prone to a vulnerability, well, we really didn't, uh, we couldn't do anything about about that case, right? We couldn't uh, prevent any vulnerability from happening under that scenario. Okay, so now again, it begs the question: Why? It turns out that there are historical reasons for this behavior. So what we have here, uh, what we have here is a piece of BSD code, and we have a trailing array of a concrete size at compile time. However, this array at runtime behaves as a flexible array member. So it means it grows from 14 bytes up to 255. <laughs> and and that, that was actually uh, the reason why uh, building uh, compiler functions like building object size uh, was saying, well, I really don't know because probably you want to use this train array as a flexible array, so I better don't mess with that. So, of course, we, <laughs> we reported this to, uh, to compiler developers, and, and yeah, that's what they say. Um, they, they said that, well, basically, there were a lot of, uh, of uh, legacy code bases out there that were doing strange things with flexible arrays and trailing arrays, so they decided just to ignore completely that case. The problem with this behavior is that it prevents the correct evaluation of, of building object size and another important compiler building function, which is building dynamic object size. So that's really a bug, that's a problem. Okay, so what can we do? Can we do something about it? Let's see. Yeah, we can do different things. Uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can tackle this issue uh, in two different fronts. On the compiler side, well, we need to find a way to, uh, uh, well, we need to fix building object size, right? And building dynamic object size. And on the kernel side, we need to remove the ambiguity that at the time we had uh, of using any, 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 any size for a trailing array and that uh, probably what we wanted to do is, uh, is to use a flexible array and in other cases probably uh, we, we really just want to use that array uh, with that size. So yeah, one of the things that we could do or that we had to do is on the compiler side fix, fix building uh, object size and there was uh, another, another option that was added to, uh, to, to, to GCC and Clang, F strict flex arrays. So with this compiler option, uh, what we could do is we, we enable this compiler option. Now we, we can remove uh, what we started to call fake flexible arrays from the kernel. And instead of using fake flexible arrays to declare an, a flexible array, to enforce using only C99 flexible array members. So yeah, that's what we do in the kernel side. And it has taken us five years to do that. Just recently, we, uh, we, we declared that, that work completed. However, it might be possible that there are some stranders out there under some strange configuration, but, uh, but yeah. Okay, now let's see how uh, strict flex arrays works. This was released back in, in GCC 13 and Clang 16. In the kernel, uh, well, this has different level values that we can use for, uh, to, um, for this compiler option. The level value three is the strictest one. This means that only C99 flexible array members are going to be treated as flexible arrays. So that means that if the compiler run into a trailing array of any concrete size, this time those building uh, functions are going to treat these trailing arrays as objects of a concrete size, right? And they are going to return the actual size of the object. So yeah, with this, uh, all trailing arrays of fixed size, uh, game bounce checking, 
with the fortified version of main copy. Because now building object size in mode one is behaving correctly, right? Of course, as long as we have a, a strict flex arrays enabled. So yeah, so even if we have a one element array or a zero length array, these building compiler functions are, are going to return exactly the size of those objects and they are not going to return minus one anymore. So yeah, we enabled this compiler option uh, back in, in, in Linux uh, 6.5. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, it was really, it was not that simple. It could probably, some of you might think that it was just uh, a matter of replacing or removing the one or the zero and that's it. But no, we ran into a lot of issues. I have, uh, I have given a couple of presentations talking about uh, this case in particular. So if you are curious about it, well, uh, I, can, I can point you to, to those later. Okay, so yeah, so with this, uh, the ambiguity is gone, right? Only C99 flexible array members are allowed as flexible arrays in the kernel. So yeah, we've gained bounce checking on training arrays of fixed size again. Okay, but we are ambitious. What about bounce checking flexible array members? How, how can we do that? If this compiler, this build, this building compiler functions uh, are, are, are returning minus one or saying that they don't know the size, how, how, can, we, how can we gain bounce checking on, this, on these arrays? Okay, give me a second, I need to drink some water. Sorry. Okay, so we have a new compiler attribute. We have the, the counted by attribute. How many of you know about this, this attribute already? A few of you, great, okay. I, I wrote uh, a blog post uh, about how to use this, uh, this attribute in, in any C code base, and in particular in the kernel. Uh, again, I can point you to, to, that, to that post later if you are curious about it. Okay, so yeah, this, uh, this is under, under, under development in GCC 15. King Xiao is the person in charge of developing this, uh, this, this compiler attribute. She's a great GCC developer and she's also part of the kernel self-protection project. And this was recently released in, in Clang 18, so you, you, can, you can use this, this attribute. And well, this was developed by uh, Bill Wendlin. He's also part of the project and he's a Google employee. Okay, so how this works? Well, basically, um, with counted by, we can we we have a way to link the flexible array with Oh, hello, hello, yeah, low battery. <laughs> okay, anyways, let's continue here. Okay, I tried to use my my pointer. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, now, with, the, with this compiler attribute, uh, we have a way to link um, the, the member in the structure that is going to be, to be used as the counter at runtime with our flexible array member. So here is how this works. It points to, to, to that struct, struct member in, in our containing structure, and uh, well, it's going to be to, uh, to, to give insight. Uh, well, building, building compiler functions like building dynamic object size is going to gain insight into the size of a flexible array at runtime. So, in the kernel, well, we have, uh, we have macros for, for, for everything, so that's what we use in the kernel. So you, you take a look at kernel code, you are, you are going to see uh, these sort of annotations, right? So that's what, what you should use in the kernel. Okay, now let's get a, well, let's talk a little bit about this uh, building dynamic object size uh, building function. So once uh, counted by was released, now what we did for, uh, for the 45 version main copy was uh, we replaced building object size with this, uh, uh, with this other building compiler function. So now we gain, uh, if we have, uh, now that we have converted or transformed all those uh, fake flexible array members into C99 flexible array members, we went and, and did the work of annotating 
uh, basically all of them, right? Uh, that's work in progress, but we, we have made a lot of progress already. So well, with this, now we use building dynamic object size in main copy, and well, we gain uh, runtime coverage on flexible array members. And yeah, that's a great fortification for main copy. And well, you can, you can get, uh, if you build your, your kernel code, um, you can enable this fortification uh, with this uh, config 40, 45 source configuration. And yeah, well, with counted by and building dynamic object size, now we finally gain bounce checking on, on flexible array members. I'll give you a second to take pictures. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, now let's take another look again. Uh, what, what, what is the final? Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I, if I say this at the beginning, but this is, if you take a look at, uh, at main copy in, in the kernel, this is not actually how it looks. This is a simplification. Of, uh, of the 45 version of my copy. Um, it's, it's more complex, but it boils down to, to this. So yeah, now we use building dynamic object size mode one, right? Okay, up to this point, uh, we have explored basically the evolution of, uh, uh, of the 45, uh, of a 45 main copy in the Linux kernel. From before even bad vibes, uh, up to this point, now we have, we, well, we have gained a lot of coverage, right? Okay, now, um, this is a new compiler option. This, is, uh, um, this was released recently in GCC 14. Now that we, that we transform all those fake flexible arrays into flexible array members, we are left with these sorts of cases. Uh, we, we have objects of the type of a flexible structure in the middle of other structures. And that's an issue. That's an issue because that, that again, if we allocate heap space for those objects and we write data into them, we are going to run into undefined behavior again, right? We are going to corrupt uh, the following adjacent members in that structure. So yeah, now we, uh, it seems like we are playing guacamole, right? Well, yeah, that's, uh, this is actually, this is something I, I've been working on uh, this year. And I went and built the, the kernel code and I found more than 60,000 of these warnings in the kernel. And of course, before, before doing the work of transforming uh, those fake flexible arrays, we didn't have this, this amount of warnings. And I actually, I was curious about it and we only had like 8,000. Right before before starting uh, to transform those those fake flexible arrays. Fortunately, well, about one percent of them are are unique issues, right? And most of them, of course, are false positives. So again, we have the case of uh, we implement a compiler feature, uh, and if we want to to be uh, added to the kernel or accepted upstream, we need to do the work. We we have to allocate the pain of fixing thousands of false positives. So that's, that's always the case in, uh, in kernel hardening. Okay, so I went and, and took a look uh, at all those, uh, well, not all, but uh, a good number of those 60, uh, 150 issues. And I basically discovered like, uh, I, I could classify them into four main categories. So let's see one by one. So in the first case is when the flexible array member is never actually used at all in the code list, right? So we just remove it and that's it. That was, that was quite simple. And um, unfortunately, I, only, I have only run into a couple of these cases, just a couple of those. The other scenario is when the flexible array member is, is, never, is never used through the composite structure. I mean, what I mean here is that we, we, don't, we never access the flexible array. We might access the other members in the flexible structure, but we never access the flexible array, right? So, well, that's, uh, that seems that is a little bit, um, it doesn't seem that complicated, but uh, because we are not actually accessing the object. And well, this is again, this is something I've been working on. And well, 
I, I have I show you in the previous slide. Here I have like uh, commit IDs that you can go and take a look, and you are going to see each one uh, of these examples in, in more detail, right? Uh, it's not the purpose of this, of this presentation to go in detail through each one of these cases because, well, I'm going to present a plumbers this Thursday where I'm going to deliver a presentation uh, just, just to explain this, this problem. So if you happen to, to, to attend, well, it'd be great. If not, well, you are going to see this presentation on YouTube in a couple of months. Okay, let's continue. So yeah, in this case, in the second, in the second case, the second category is when we, we might access the other members in the flexible structure, but we never access the flexible array member. The third, the third category, uh, which is actually the most complex one, most complicated one, is when we, we have an implicit union. What we have here, we have a flexible structure, and as you can see, we have um, well, an object uh, of the type of this flexible structure in the middle, and the following member is a fixed size array, but is of the same element type as our flexible array member. That's what's interesting, right? So yeah, those, uh, those, those arrays share the same, the same address in memory. And actually this is totally intentional. What, what people is doing, are doing there is that, well, they are, they, they are already allocating space to iterate over the flexible array uh, with this trick, right? So it's, it's interesting, yeah. And, th there are a lot, and, and there are a lot of cases like, like that. And, and it's really fun to, to address them. Of course, it's frustrating too, but, but it's a lot of fun, really. Uh, yeah. So the fourth, the fourth category is exactly the same, but on stack. So we have here, this, is, this, is, uh, this code is on stack, and it's exactly the same case. So people want to use uh, the flexible structure and the flexible array member, and they are allocating stack space for the number of elements they, they know they are going to use, right? And, and that's it. But again, if we want to enable uh, this, compiler, this compiler option, we have to modify this code somehow, right? And, um, and well, the good news is that I, I already figured something out. Um, I've, been, I've been doing a lot of, uh, I've been sending a lot of patches for this. And well, by the way, these are some examples of this four category. Uh, it is interesting to see because we are using other, uh, other helpers that, um, that are, I mean, are as, as crazy or as are versatile as true group. Okay, so yeah, I've been, I've been uh, sending a lot of patches. Uh, well, not a lot, but a couple dozen patches already are in mainline. And well, uh, with those patches, I managed to go uh, to, to get from 600 of these unique warnings down to uh, a little bit more than 300. So almost half of them. And, and that accounts for almost 30% uh, of those 60K warnings. So yeah, I've been fixing thousands of warnings. <laughs> Okay, some conclusions. We had the problem of uh, intentional cross-member overflows and vulnerabilities like that of bad vibes. The solution for that is, well, we, we modify Mencopy and now we use building dynamic object size in mode one, right? However, then after this, we run into the issue of fixing a good number of false positives that had to do with cross-member overflows. So how did we fix that? For that, we can use true group. Uh, well, by the way, if, you, if you, are, uh, you have your own pet projects or you are working on any other C code base that is not the Linux kernel, you can copy exactly these techniques that we are using, they are going to work, right? So that's, that's another, another thing that you can do and you are going to help uh, secure more code bases out there. Okay, then we, we had the issue of the ambiguity uh, of trailing arrays and flexible array members. So that was fixed um, by doing flexible array transformations across the whole kernel tree, and of course, uh, enabling strict flex arrays in the strictest, with the strictest level value. Then we ran into the, into the, into the problem or the challenge of uh, 
bounds checking on flexible arrays. That is fixed uh, with a counted by attribute. And again, uh, building dynamic object size now uh, has a way to know how big, our, how big this array is at runtime, right? So the code gets instrumented with this uh, building dynamic object size function. Then we, we run into the issue of flexible arrays in the middle. Well, that is fixed um, by enabling this, uh, this new compiler uh, um, option. And this is code in progress, and we have to do a lot of cleanup. I think out of, uh, the, out of uh, those 600 uh, warnings, probably three or five were actual bugs, actual issues, actual problems in the code base. And that, that, would, account, that, that, that would account for 1% of, uh, of, of the total number of issues we, we have, right? of unique issues. Um, however, it's important, even if we, if we, uh, if we found uh, one issue, it's important to enable these compiler options to harden the kernel because, well, I mean, it could be the difference between uh, having your, your, your code base exploited or not, right? Uh, usually, nowadays, it's, it's difficult that someone or, or, a, or a group of people exploit a system just by abusing one vulnerability. Usually, it's a change of, of issues that they have to, to discover and, and exploit and abuse. But, uh, but one of them, one of these might be uh, might be one of those issues uh, in, in that change of exploitation, right? So it's important to, to fix those. So, yeah, well, I, I already have a clear strategy on how to enable this compiler option. Uh, again, if you are curious, you can take a look at the, uh, at the commit IDs. This presentation is already uploaded. It's, you, can, you can already uh, take a look at it. And well, uh, if you want to, uh, to gain all this fortification, uh, you can enable, you can build your kernel enabling this, uh, these configurations. And yeah, well, I want to think that we are, we are improving the security of the kernel. And, um, and that's it. Thank you.